it's time we zoom our lens back to Hong Kong. Our next speaker probably needs no introduction. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Hong Kong Council of Social Service. Let us welcome Ms. Christine Fan. She will share with us how she sees the future of social innovation in Hong Kong, the challenges, and more importantly, the opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, friends. Uh, I have to thank the Bohemia Foundation for bringing in Jeff and Rashanara to here today. I've met uh, Jeff in 06 after their seminar in China. And uh, at that time, 06, they're bringing in social innovation into China. And I think this is a very good opportunity if in Hong Kong that we have, can pick the brains of these two excellent people and see how we look at things in a different way and do things in a better way. So, so uh, uh, people knows me that I will be speaking from the social service sector. So it may be something that I can throw out and, and, and you can bring in more about how innovation works socially from other aspects. Um, so I'll start, what is uh, innovation or social innovation in Hong Kong? I mean, we crack our brains, I mean, the sun comes out every day and what are the new things that we can think of? Uh, I got this quote, um, from Jeff uh, some years ago. It's new ideas that work, work what? Work to meet pressing and met needs. And the end purpose in to, is to improve people's lives. Uh, I'll give you three cases of unmet needs and how we've tried it out in Hong Kong. Uh, we haven't gone up to the fifth and sixth stage of scaling up and systemic change, but these may be areas that we can discuss more with the business and the government sector also here. What are the three e cases that I will talk about? Youth unemployment, something what uh, Rashinara talked about. We also have this in Hong Kong. I think the young and r the restless this gives away my age. Do you still remember the soap opera? <laughs> and uh, youth employment here in Hong Kong is three times as high as the general unemployment rate in Hong Kong. And we have issues of youth drug substance abuse, which is eating in into the fabric of, of our, our new generation globally as well as in Hong Kong. There are concerns of failures in schools difficult to go back into the mainstream. How do we get young people back up on their own feet? The other example is on disadvantaged women, um, especially those low skilled and less educated. We have an issue of cross-border marriages. Now, four out of 10 marriages in Hong Kong are cross-border cross -border marriages from mainland who don't, uh, women who don't have their education or their work experience recognized once they cross the border. But they're not entitled to public assistance too. Before they live here for seven years, they have to do whatever job they can get or they have to listen to their husband or whatever they say. So how, how do NGOs respond to that? And the third is on the aging population. We have more and more elderly living on their own, 200,000 of them living either as singletons or two elderly together. I mean, one of the issues is how they face the end state of the life. How do they plan? It's a taboo of, of Asian to talk about death. How do we break this taboo and help them plan? The innovation I will talk about is two from two, uh, a social, two, from two social enterprises and one from uh, an NGO. Some of you may know about it. These three response uh, to the three cases of needs that I have told you earlier. School of Hip Hop, Arts Alive and City Challenge. It's three social enterprises that has 
been put together by an NGOs working with young people. The Three Social Enterprises is a hip-hop school, dancing, and also music. These are what we heard from Rashinara. These are, let's go back to what people are good at most, what they enjoy most. And then one daring game, jumping from the 13th floor, climbing and jumping. What, it, what do they mean? And how did, it be, how did it become a solution for youth unemployment and, and, and also oh, a social oh, remedy? So these three social enterprises actually started separately. They started with, with something they hear from young people. And this is the motor that have carried them through. Love what kids love and empower them to do it. They love to dance then start something that they can excel in. Start a hip-hop school, which these street kids can go back to schools and teach other young children, other schools, their friends who are, are, are top in class, to do hip-hop and empower them. It started like this. Now they're thinking of regional competitions, which these young people can stand up on stage and say they are number one and not like this. Doing music on their own. This social enterprise made up a, a studio which young people can make their own CDs, sing their own songs. And this is what it, they've started to get people, yeah, other young people to come in. And uh, they have, we help them to network with the businesses which get these uh, the, the manager, the, the, the training managers to come in and feel what the Generation Y is thinking, to do daring exercise jumping from the 13th floor on a, on a rope. So these are this, the, the, the business side to it, which they link back them to schools where they can ex excel in another status and also bringing the business people to come in and learn from young people. This is one case. The other case, it's um, women, the low educa uh, uh, less educated and less skilled. What are they good at? They're good at taking care of babies and children, healthy mothers-to-be. These are the, in Chinese, we call the po yu, the first month of childbirth. In Hong Kong, we have 200,000 overseas domestic workers from the Philippines. But when you're giving in birth to your first child and the grandparents all were only looking at you. So these are the, the uh, business opportunities for Chinese women who have gone through the stage of rearing their own child where they're good at that combined with this, the, the scientific knowledge of child rearing, bathing babies which we teach them, um, asking nurses to teach them and they can become the first month of childbirth, they are sent to the homes of the mothers-to-be, uh, the, the new mothers, cook soup, the Chinese soup for them, uh, uh, which, and help them um, to take care of their newborn. This has become a real business. Each of these, these uh, uh, lady who, who work, they can earn 1,000 US dollars a month. And it has become a good business. Now they're expending it to looking after young children. Younger children, which, which the family would still like, like uh, 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 these uh, helpers to continue. And it has becoming a business. So we're thinking of how to scale it up. The third example, talking about death. One thing that elders fear most, elders who live alone fear most, that when they pass away, when they go through the last stage, they will end up just as a number because nobody will, build, will, will, will burn incense for them and nobody will take a look after their graves or sweep their graves. These are single elderly. One NGO started with helping these, these um, elderly living alone. Then it became an idea. Other elderly who can pay and willing to pay come up to them to help. 
I mean, can we know more? They took them to look at these paper coffins. They, t they helped them talk about what they want to do in advanced treatment. This is how they've started. A, a breaking taboos, empowering life through planning for death. It's a creative blend. Empowering them to face death. And it started as a service, becomes a business, and business is also a service. Nobody likes to go into this business, but it's lucrative. We, it's subject, elderly are subject to abuse. Family members are too. But NGOs, with the trust, the trust in the business, it worked. So, I'd like to go back to the key learning points from these three cases. The idea, how did it start? You start with where people hurt most, where they face a problem. So the end user focus is where to start. You try to hear and feel the problem from the end. So all these three love kids what they love and empower them. Listen to what these women have to contribute, what they're good at. They may not be, they have the best certificates, but they, they're good at that. And listen to their worries and you'll get the trust to do it. And very often, people at the bottom will hear it, but do they have the channel to connect it up? To connect it up where they have the resources. I was talking to Rashinara. For businesses, you get rewarded for new ideas because it brings money. But for social innovation, you get punished if you have new idea. Because you have to go around to sell the idea and you have to convince your boss to give you the resources to try it out. So how can we visibly value and reward these innovations? I have the funeral navigation and service uh, agency head here, Michael Lai. This is what they did. They reward our um, staff, the 10 sparkling new ideas among them. How to include in the personal uh, 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 evaluation each year. One NGO called, has a special room which they call the labor room. But whenever you have an idea, they push them inside. So, so how to visibly value these processes. And it is a process how ideas are nurtured, tested. We hear that they're, they're the six spiraling steps. But is, how do we get them in place? What are the conduits and how to get connected for innovation? We hear about social innovation exchange. I heard it in Australia, how they have crossed boundaries, world boundaries, to give ideas and make it work. How to break silos. I mean, we have, it's good that we have different government departments here, but we started this morning. Which departments look after social innovation? Who will resource it? and how to create and scale it up. The three ideas, the three cases that I spoke about is not, not yet scaled up. We're ready on sale. Any new uh, business leaders would like, I'll introduce you. I mean, mistakes can happen. Innovation, it doesn't come um, um, easy. But failure to learn is something that we should be doing. What are the conducive environment to innovation? I'll, I'll throw out the ideas. Maybe when we have the discussion, we can talk more. We need to map out needs and uncommon insights. I've talked about experience in individuals, NGOs, but as a society, we need statistics. We need to hear. We need to hear what people at the end, where it hurts most, and how these voices can come out how we allow people to think of wild things and think out of the box. We need leadership and structure to help groom innovation. Is it a special team? Is it decentralizing? How do we create space? Do we have labor rooms in each, each department? How do we resource 
people that have new ideas. I mean, ideas doesn't always work. The testing, assessing, and improving, it's a process. It's just not a, a, a dream. The partnerships, what kind of partnerships? I've prepared a three bar, a tripartite partnership. We hear it from Jeff that it's a four-way partnership. I mean, should there be dedicated incubators and, and accelerators for innovation? I learned this word from the book I read from um, our two speakers. But what is it? I mean, the council, we, we, we've been trying to force a tripartite partnership with our caring company scheme. We see the strength of the civil society working with the market and the government, but somehow it's a science of muddling through. Are there any rigorous knowledge or experiences that we can, can work together? And uh, civil society is close to the floor. We hear, we give voices to people in need, but how to link it up and make it a business. Business, you have technology, but you need returns. How can we translate social innovation into measurable returns that you would invest in? And what kind of leadership we need from the government? What kind of resourcing? What kind of recognition? I'll end with the plus and minus, the positive and uh, the opportunities and challenges. In Hong Kong, it's, we have a vibrant civil society that knows social needs, but these are observations from the ground. We need linkages between these observations. We need to be more scientific. We have good partnership. Hong Kong is small. Rashnara said, everybody knows everybody. I mean, government is ready to give out seat money, seat money only. <laughs> they are matching grants, but how to link it up, how to sustain? It's more we look at the negative side. NGOs, I'll look at our, our NGOs work in silos. I mean, they, we, we, each NGO reinvent their own wheels. How to break those silos? And I hope the government has this reflection too. We have weak linkage with university. We, have, we can see one university here, and we are in a university compound. But innovation, we need sciences. We need generation of knowledge, wisdom, that can accumulate. How can we link it up? Resourcing R&D. We see social innovation, we are punished by that. Having, I mean, you talk too much, you have too much ideas. How do we resource it? And in Hong Kong, we are in a well-established society. We cannot have Grameen Bank starting in Hong Kong. We have a very well-banking system. No charity banks. What are the spaces? What are the, we ask the space, we ask where's the need. So these are something that we can talk about. The last word, innovation is not a wish, but a discipline. And to touch at something required the talking to stop and the action to begin. Thank you. <laughs>